Yep. Did someone introduce me or do I just begin talking? I will do that, Michael. Okay. Uh, well, um, I don't know if you need an introduction because uh, anyone who searches your name uh, on Google uh, will encounter many things, many sites where uh, uh, your accomplishments have been uh, uh, published. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, I met Michael about 23 years ago uh, on a uh, mailing list. Uh, Michael Keeney and I were the uh, moderators and uh, we invited Michael to discuss uh, one of his books, uh, Super Imperialism. Uh, and since then our friendship continued uh, we uh, spent some time during the Great uh, Recession 2007-2009 uh, in New York together, uh, every now and then meeting for lunches uh, near NYU, New York University, uh, discussing what has been going on. Uh, we even uh, at one point uh, co-authored an article. Uh, Michael is difficult to describe. Uh, he is more than many things. Uh, anthropologist, uh, economist, economic historian, what have you. Uh, he is an astrologist, Babylon historian and things like that. Uh, probably uh, uh, one of the persons who know about the history of economics as well as finance uh, better than most other people. Um, I don't know what more to say. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, let him talk and uh, okay. we'll see what he says. Well, so many of you uh, have known me for so long that I'm not going to simply rehash uh, my overall analysis and my usual uh, uh, summary ideas. We already agree that financialization and uh, the fire sector, uh, the concentration of wealth uh, is creating a new oligarchy. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to be more philosophical uh, today and talk about the really long picture and how the problem is not simply uh, the U.S. and Western Europe becoming rentier oligarchies, but about how their political inability to resist oligarchy goes all the way back to classical Greece and Rome uh, and the way in which Western civilization failed from the very beginning uh, to have a, a state power able to block the emergence of an oligarchy, taking over society uh, by, uh, by debt and by uh, debt leading to uh, monopolization of uh, land ownership. Uh, and uh, all of this really began in the seventh and sixth centuries BC, and we're still suffering from the way the classical antiquity collapsed and uh, the way that uh, uh, Rome collapsed into feudalism, but even though it collapsed, it bequeathed the pro-creditor uh, and general economic ethic to the modern world, uh, namely that of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, all of that is, uh, is sort of occurred before. The privatization, uh, the, uh, the idea of selfishness for the oligarchy, the idea that government was bad uh, and uh, you shouldn't have any government, uh, any kingship, or any tyrant uh, that is capable of checking the uh, uh, the oligarchy by canceling debts and redistributing land. Well, as it happens just today, finally, my book, Class uh, The Collapse of Antiquity, is out. It was just posted on Amazon today. And this is the book that I'd worked on uh, for a number of years. Uh, is the second volume in my history of debt uh, and debt revolutions. And uh, the failure of uh, the debt revolutions in Rome and Italy uh, to, uh, and Greece uh, to, uh, to succeed uh, and the defeat of uh, the, uh, the balanced economy as oligarchies took over uh, in uh, various uh, Greek cities and finally uh, they were all conquered uh, by Rome. So it, it's, uh, all of this was also described uh, in the uh, Jewish Bible uh, and the Christian Bible, uh, as if we're it's as if we're living in the end time. Uh, but the end of what? Well, today you could say that it's the end of modernism, 
And that's why I decided to uh, show, uh, you know, what is this postmodernism? It's really neoliberalism. Uh, it's really the idea of the fighting back against uh, everything that was progressive in industrial capitalism. And uh, industrial capitalism really was progressive in the sense that it uh, wanted to free economies from the legacy of feudalism. It wanted to get rid of the landlord class. That was the whole uh, uh, essence of Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, uh, Marx, uh, 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 Thorstein Veblen. The whole of classical political economy was designed to uh, uh, value and price theory that would isolate economic rent is unearned income and make sure that either it was taxed away or that uh, any rent yielding uh, activity would be taken into the public sector uh, and land would be nationalized and uh, the basic utilities uh, would be nationalized. Uh, that was where capitalism seemed to be going uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, and you could look uh, at what happened uh, after World War I as a whole fight uh, to prevent industrial capitalism from uh, uh, evolving into socialism and instead making a detour that pushed it into uh, finance capitalism. So uh, if you look at the way in which classical Greece and Rome developed without kingship that had occurred throughout the Near East uh, of creditors and property owners uh, taking over society and enriching themselves by impoverishing the 99%, you find uh, certain historic invariables uh, that, that you have today. And uh, you could see of all of antiquity. Uh, my book describes uh, the six centuries of failed revolutions in Greece and Rome uh, that were uh, brutally put down uh, by the uh, creditor oligarchy. And uh, the oligarchy won, and uh, the result was a dark age. And uh, the dynamic of that is exactly the same dynamic that we're feeling today in uh, Western civilization. Uh, and basically, uh, we've seen for the last hundred years uh, the academic economics uh, defining a, uh, a free market is just the opposite. As, uh, of uh, how the classical economists described it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you all know from my, my writings that uh, the idea uh, of, of a market is who's going to be free? Well, the 99%, will the economy be free of a rentier class, free of a landlord class, of a predatory banking class, and of a monopolist? Or will the landlords and monopolists and financiers and credit, uh, be free to uh, uh, in debt the 99% and impoverish them. Uh, the question is, who's going to be free? Well, certainly, whenever the Romans talked about liberty, they meant the liberty of the oligarchy, not to be constrained by any popular power or by kings. And the way that you would uh, criticize any social reformer in Rome was to say, well, he's an egotist seeking kingship. Uh, and in Greece, they would say uh, he's seeking to be a tyrant. Well, the original tyrants in the uh, seventh and sixth centuries were the founders of democracy. They were the people who overthrew the mafia-like uh, 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 aristocracies that uh, controlled the land. They took over, they canceled the debts, they redistributed the land, and they paved the way for uh, progress. Well, no wonder uh, when they were called tyrants at first, this wasn't a bad word. It was, I think, taken over, they believe, from the Pers Persians. But uh, after the fifth century, the word tyrant became a bad word, not a good word. Uh, today, we would call them uh, uh, socialists. Well, socialism has become a bad word today in many sectors, uh, uh, communism. So uh, the word tyrant was, had uh, sort of the same linguistic uh, and uh, uh, interpretive fate as uh, uh, socialism. Well. Uh, the landed aristocracy and predatory banking uh, were uh, sort of the uh, the legacy of feudalism and postmodernism. It really has been created by the rentier classes that fought back against classical econ uh, economy, uh, and that's why you don't have the history of economic thought taught in the academic uh, economics curriculum anymore. Uh, there's a, a kind of expurgation of thought, as if. Uh, all Adam Smith and all the others 
who wanted to get rid of the Rontiers was actually trying to uh, 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 support uh, uh, the freedom of Rontiers to do whatever they wanted without uh, uh, having their economic rents taxed away uh, by government. So uh, what we're seeing, in a way, uh, modernism was supposed to be hand in hand with democratization. Uh, certainly, uh, the whole fight in uh, 1848 in Europe was the idea to uh, shift power away from the House of Lords, away from the aristocracy, into uh, the House of Commons. Uh, and uh, they needed to uh, shift this power away in order to produce a, to reduce the costs of doing uh, industrial business. Uh, they, they, uh, England could not have been competitive if it would have had the landlord class doing what the landlord class does today, uh, uh, taking, uh, raising all of the rents and uh, uh, essentially uh, making housing such a large uh, portion of labor's income that uh, no industrial employer can afford to uh, employ labor paying high rents like that or high debts and uh, compete with, uh, with uh, foreign economies. Well, uh, you're, uh, today you see uh, that land has been democratized. 80% uh, home ownership in Europe, 57% uh, in the United States in uh, 2006. It's now been rolled back below 50%, by the way. Uh, democratization has not been able to check this uh, uh, power of uh, the rentier oligarchy. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't able to in Greece and Rome either. And when Aristotle wrote his study of constitutions, he said many constitutions describe themselves as democratic, uh, but in fact, they're oligarchic. And he described the evolution of democracy into oligarchies, which then tried to make themselves into a hereditary aristocracy and uh, uh, basically a, a slow down economy uh, until the, uh, there were so few wealthy uh, aristocratic families that they fought among themselves. And one family or two would get together and take the, the people, the public, into their hands, and they'd overthrow the other uh, aristocracies and uh, uh, sort of end up uh, uh, winning and democratizing society. And you'd have the whole cycle begin all over again. Well, that seemed to be happening in Athens after Pleisthenes uh, redid the uh, Constitution in uh, 506 BC, but it, uh, it wasn't to be repeated. Uh, it didn't, there was no democratic revolution in Rome. Uh, every time a popular leader would develop, there were political assassinations. Uh, it was, uh, they, they didn't have a CAA and they didn't have an American embassy to do it, but uh, the, the leaders were always assassinated. Their followers were, were killed from the fifth century BC right down to, uh, to Julius Caesar, who they worried was going to cancel the debts. So the result is that in today's economy is that uh, democratization of land with everybody being able to obtain a home if they want is that the uh, rent uh, of the land, uh, the rental value that used to be paid to the hereditary landlord class uh, is now paid by homeowners to commercial banks as interest. So uh, the rent that was the focus of 19th century thought uh, is being paid out uh, in interest. And uh, one of the virtues of looking at the Greek and Roman uh, economic history and the uh, political discussions of democracy that came out of it is they were very clear that finance was the key to uh, the uh, polarization that was impoverished society. Well, uh, you can see what happened uh, uh, in the wake of World War I. Uh, modernism somehow anticipated uh, that uh, industrial capitalism was going to evolve into a mixed economy. Uh, in the United States, you had uh, the government taking over more and more of the uh, basic uh, uh, public needs. And uh, it was a, uh, this was basically what socialism was all about. It was having the government provide uh, basic needs as a public right. Uh, land was uh, to be taxed away or uh, was to, to be assured that everybody would have a home. Uh, full employment uh, was to be uh, assured. And uh, the idea was that uh, some, the banking system was going to be industrialized and uh, used to create credit, to create uh, a new means of production to employ, uh, to employ capital, uh, to employ labor. 
Well, we all know that that hasn't uh, worked. And instead of uh, 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 employers paying a high enough wages to cover uh, the cost of all of these rentier charges, Socialism was supposed to uh, lower the cost, and that, that's the reason that uh, right down through World War II, uh, it's funny to read uh, the United States reports on what it uh, uh, feared about uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, and I have a chapter of this in Superimperialism, that the United States worried from the beginning that Russia would un be able to undersell the United States because so many of the uh, Russian activities, uh, home ownership, uh, leisure, medical care, were uh, provided freely by the state, uh, and uh, there was no way that capitalism uh, in the West uh, could uh, compete with it. So uh, this uh, this idea of preventing uh, the what had been the ideal of the 19th century was uh, very explicit uh, in Western civilization, uh, and that the last century has really seen a reversal of uh, everything that uh, uh, had been uh, supported by the classical economists and uh, post postmodern uh, markets oppose uh, government ownership. We've seen basically uh, what's postmodernism. It's Thatcherism, it's uh, Reaganism, it's uh, the neoliberal uh, economics uh, that leads uh, 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 President Biden and uh, Secretary of State Blinken again and again to say uh, the world is dividing into two parts, uh, American democracy versus autocracy. And by democracy, he means what uh, Aristotle said was really oligarchy. And by autocracy, he means a state powerful enough to, to prevent an oligarchy from taking over and increasing the cost structure uh, for industry and for the economy uh, as a whole. And uh, this is exactly what it was uh, back in uh, Greece and Rome. Uh, the uh, Aristotle uh, described uh, this uh, political triangle, as I said, uh, and uh, 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 Romans uh, tried to, to uh, describe this, but again, uh, almost all of the uh, 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 writings of the revolutionists have been destroyed. Uh, you had the final uh, military battle uh, was the uh, Catiline uh, conspiracy, and uh, they were overthrown. Well, th that's what I describe in the collapse of antiquity. It's the long civil war trying to free economies from what became the Roman Empire uh, and the uh, uh, under the kings. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, it was clear where this was going at the beginning. They were very eloquent. Uh, uh, descriptions of how all of this was going to fail already in the second century BC, uh, when the Gracchi brothers uh, uh, were killed, uh, when their followers uh, were killed. Uh, there was one leader after another whose followers would be killed and vast civil wars. And somehow all of this is left out of the textbooks that uh, have come to idealize uh, Rome as if it were a democracy, just as uh, uh, they idealized the United States uh, as if uh, it's a democracy. So uh, I, I, when I wrote this book, I came to the conclusion that Western civilization really means rejecting central power strong enough to check the emergence of oligarchs. Uh, and if you think of, uh, of that as a central political uh, drive, uh, and of the uh, uh, corruption of democracy into oligarchy, that is a common theme that you find uh, in one wave after another, uh, from antiquity all the way down uh, to the um, modern age. And that's the political philosophy tradition that has prevented Western uh, economists uh, from modernizing uh, in the sense of the, uh, uh, that the classical economists uh, were trying to modernize. Uh, and in fact, uh, postmodernism really is pre-modernism. It's trying to push economies back into neo-feudalism, into the rentier economy that uh, industrial capitalism sought to uh, free economies from uh, before it was uh, uh, transformed into finance capitalism. So uh, this postmodern neoliberal fight against political uh, pol uh, politics aims to uh, shift planning to uh, the financial centers. And that means into the financial planning is very short term, uh, as we've seen with uh, the Silicon Valley uh, bank collapsing. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see uh, the banks today.
about what we're, we've been talking about, as uh, uh, Sabri just said, for the last, uh, for more than 20 years. Uh, economic economics has become postmodernist. And that's why it's dropped the history of economic thought from the curriculum uh, and uh, economic history itself, uh, as if somehow we're, there's a timeless ideal, and the timeless ideal is right where we are today, and uh, it's all uh, for the best. Uh, so the, the problem today is worse than a problem. It's a quandary. A problem has a solution, but a quandary can't be solved. At least it can't be solved without making things worse. Uh, mathematically, uh, this means that uh, today's uh, economy is in the optimum position. Optimum means that any move you make makes things even worse. And you can see what's happened when uh, the uh, Federal Reserve and the European Central Banks have tried to move away from the zero interest rate policy. Uh, they realized uh, that uh, you can't just keep flooding uh, the uh, financial sector and fire sector uh, with credit without uh, uh, go uh, leading to a financial crash. Uh, and uh, so they begin to raise interest rates but the real, the, their excuse for raising interest rates wasn't that they thought the financial class was getting too rich, even though the charts show uh, the 1% and the financial class wealth going way up while real wages are going down. Uh, the, uh, the Federal Reserve said uh, the problem's not uh, wealth at the top. It's not the finance, insurance, and real estate sector. It's that labor is, uh, labor's wages are uh, threatening to rise almost as fast as inflation. And if labor's uh, wages rise, profits uh, will not be made and there will be no way to support the stock prices that our zero interest rate policy has been uh, 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 inflating. So we've got to raise interest rates to disemploy 2 million American workers so that they'll have to fight more uh, for jobs and uh, their uh, wage gains that they've made trying to catch up uh, to inflation uh, will fail. Well, of course, there was a junk theory of inflation behind this, uh, but the idea uh, of focusing so much on uh, the banking system, the systems, uh, and the Federal Reserve's hatred of the working class, hatred of wage labor, uh, is that they didn't realize that they were bankrupting the banking class and the financial class by raising interest rates. Uh, it should have been obvious uh, to everyone, but we can now see that it wasn't uh, obvious to the financial uh, uh, managers of Silicon uh, Valley Bank or any, any other commercial bank or any bank regulator that when you raise interest rates, stock prices go down, bond prices go down, and uh, real estate prices go down. And if that goes down, then the bank reserves that back their deposits uh, are... Uh, uh, are unable to cover deposits and banks are in e negative equity. The Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank have set on a path that has pushed uh, really the whole banking system into negative equity if it were to report its, uh, its reserves and its assets on mark to market basis. What is the market value of the bonds that it's bought the stocks that it's bought, the, the loans and the long-term mortgages that it has. So uh, it's actually uh, uh, somehow, it, 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 the whole economy is uh, only the tip of the iceberg is reflected in the Credit Suisse collapse, uh, the collapse of the three uh, American banks last week. Uh, this is a problem that is endemic to uh, the, uh, the banking systems uh, and really to the policy uh, of Obama in 2009 of pushing the zero interest rate policy and uh, the vast uh, uh, inflation of asset prices. Uh, the Fed was criticized, uh, uh, obviously, for uh, pushing interest rates up to 4%. Uh, I, I should, uh, and I've, I've been criticized for, say, uh, for saying that, well, you know, the, for pointing to this problem, but uh, it's not that I'm against it. I, I would have liked to see the Fed uh, push interest rates up to 10%, or best of all, uh, uh, Paul Volcker's 20%. Uh, if, you had, if they had the courage to push it up 20%, you would have every bank insolvent, the government would take it over, you'd nationalize the banks, and finally the West would be in the happy position that China is in. Banks would be turned into public utilities, and you'd have a public control of banking, and you'd wipe out 
uh, the, uh, the the one percent uh, of the depositors. You'd wipe out uh, you, you'd wipe out the whole uh, creditor overhead. Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, it looks like the Federal Reserve has uh, uh, turned tail and been afraid to uh, to continue the high interest rates, and they've gone back to the towards the uh, zero interest rate policy because there's no way in which you can regulate the banks uh, in a situation, certainly in America, where uh, you let the banks choose who's going to be the bank regulators, and they've chose their selves, uh, former bankers to become the uh, uh, deregulators. Uh, uh, so, and the, the last thing the Federal Reserve is going to do is actively uh, regulate uh, the banks. Uh, and yet, way back in 2009, Sheila Baer, the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, wanted uh, to take a, a city bank to fail. She wanted to take it over. Uh, and uh, uh, Obama uh, essentially blocked her uh, and his uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Tim Geithner, and said, "No, the uh, the banks are our campaign contributors. That's uh, we're there to protect them, uh, not to hurt them." And uh, uh, that is the uh, the quandary that uh, Western civilization uh, is in today. What to do ab uh, about this? Because uh, the what's at issue is whether society is going to be organized as a mixed economy. Uh, with basic needs provided and protected by a public authority. Housing and natural resources, uh, money and credit will be uh, made for productive purposes, not for speculation or corporate takeovers, uh, health care and other basic needs. That's really what the key is. And obviously that's what, uh, uh, your, uh, what uh, socialist China is trying to do. And that is why Biden says that China is our enemy. Uh, it's not really that China is going to invade the United States with soldiers. It's that it has a different economic model. It's uh, resisting the postmodern neoliberal model uh, of the United States. And it's saying things don't have to be this way. Con contrary to Margaret Thatcher, there is an alternative. Uh, and that's exactly what is viewed as, uh, as a threat by, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, class, the uh, academic economics that uh, we're all criticizing. Uh, but this, this, is, this loyalty, this attempt to preserve the financial wealth on the books, the attempt to preserve the creditor claims on the indebted 99% of the economy is why uh, neither the United States nor the European economies can reindustrialize. They have built the fire sector into, uh, into rents, and uh, such high charges on on labor and on employers that uh, no uh, employer uh, can can afford uh, to hire labor that has that is so deeply indebted that uh, uh, the uh, it, it can't afford to compete uh, with uh, Asian uh, labor uh, and with uh, any country that actually has socialized uh, its basic services. So uh, this is, I think, the root of today's Cold War II with China, Russia, Iran, uh, and, and uh, Eurasia. So the, the question is, what, uh, what do we have to do to set things right? Well, the fight today is the same as in Greece and Rome, uh, which is why there's no Greek and Roman history being taught in the economics curriculum. Uh, and uh, th that fight is... Uh, to uh, do exactly what uh, every political leader and reformer for six centuries said. You needed a debt cancellation uh, and you needed a land re redistribution uh, to reverse the uh, concentration of land in the hands of the 1%. And uh, this was said so often uh, that it, uh, uh, you'd think there was no way uh, of avoiding it. Uh, the idea is to, uh, to, uh, to deprivatize uh, and to return basic needs, land, uh, labor, uh, and uh, money creation uh, to the public uh, domain. Well, what's blocking this? Well, obviously, the vested interests are blocking this. And that's what uh, Thorstein uh, uh, Veblen wrote about so much. And uh, that's why we had such a good meeting uh, in Turkey uh, uh, with Sabri and uh, uh, Ahmed Ansu a few years ago on the Veblen. Uh, history. He was the, really the last uh, classical economist uh, uh, to uh, to discuss the vested interests, and in fact coined uh, uh, the term. Uh, and uh, 
The, the problem, uh, as Veblen made fun of, is that postmodern neoliberal ideology propaganda uh, requires a lack of historical awareness as to how uh, today's economic privatization and the polarization between the finance and real estate sector on the one hand and the real production and consumption economy on the other has uh, characterized Western civilization from the very outset and is built into its political philosophy. And uh, this polarization and the power of oligarchies has been locked in to by pro-creditor legal principles uh, that support, uh, they say it's supporting uh, property ownership, but uh, it's really not supporting property ownership. It's supporting the, uh, abel the right of creditors to deprive property owners of their property by foreclosing on debt. Uh, the financial sector is not defending property ownership. It's an attack on uh, property ownership. It's, it's an attempt to uh, take property ownership away from the 99% and from the governments and put it in the hands of the 1%. That's what security of property has uh, come to mean under the postmodern uh, uh, dictionary. Uh, so the buildup of debt and the transfer of property to creditors uh, has been made irreversible. And that irreversibility is the other factor that distinguishes Western civilization from the Near Eastern takeoff. And I described the Near Eastern takeoff in uh, And Forgive Them Their Debts, uh, where I showed that uh, every uh, non-Western society before, uh, uh, before Greece and Rome, uh, and, and that included uh, the, uh, the Jewish lands, uh, uh, periodically canceled the debts. They, pro they proclaimed clean slates uh, as what was described in uh, the Jewish Jubilee year of uh, Leviticus 25, cancel the debts, free the debt uh, bond persons uh, from debt, and uh, return uh, the uh, return land uh, to families that had lost it, so you redistribute land again. That it was the center of the, uh, uh, the religion, not only of Judaism, but of Babylonia and the entire Near East, uh, even in Syria. Well, under the Roman Empire, you can see how uh, this was uh, transformed uh, essentially by Augustine. Uh, Augustine uh, changed uh, the Lord's Prayer to the travesty that you hear in Christian churches today. Forgive us our sins that, uh, as we forgive others. That wasn't the world's prayer. The world's prayer was forgive us our debts. But the world word sin and debt in every language is similar because in archaic times, uh, if you uh, injured uh, somebody, uh, and that was called a sin, an injury, you had to make restitution by, uh, by paying uh, uh, the debts. The idea was uh, is a clean slate, and uh, the, the Hebrew and the Greek uh, words and the Babylonian words uh, are very clear that it was uh, uh, monetary financial debts that were forgiven, not general sins. Uh, for Augustine, it was all about sex, uh, and about and he said sin is inborn. Everybody has uh, has sin. You can only get rid of it by giving your money to the Catholic Church to the poor. Uh, the poor were not the ninety nine percent. The poor were the uh, the the church uh, uh, officials. Uh, they called themselves. They characterized themselves as the poor. So uh, it, it, uh, this is sort of how the Roman Empire ended by making a travesty of Judaism, a travesty of uh, Christianity, and making it into exactly the reverse of what it, uh, what it had been uh, in the, uh, with its Near Eastern backgrounds uh, prior to making Christianity a state, re uh, the Roman state religion. Well, of course, the Roman state religion uh, was not going to criticize creditors uh, or uh, landowners because that, that they had become the state, they'd appropriated the state uh, for itself. So uh, uh, all of this is somehow airbrushed uh, out of uh, today's curriculum. Um, and uh, you basically uh, not only use ideology to fight against it, but you use force and violence. Uh, the fight against socialism has been violent in every country, uh, especially violent after the Russian Revolution, but certainly here in America. Uh, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, which was right with uh, violence. Uh, my father was a political prisoner uh, for supporting the uh, deep, uh, the labor unions and uh, uh, in Minneapolis, and uh, 
there, there were just a, a continuum of violence. And growing up, uh, all the visitors to my family would always be describing uh, their fights uh, with the police, the fights with the FBI, et cetera. Uh, but today, uh, somehow all of this, uh, if, if you can only strip this away from the curriculum, you can make it appear as if today's uh, co a concentration of finance and uh, uh, property ownership is inevitable. Uh, and if it's inevitable, uh, then it's something positive uh, to prevent an alternative. Uh, and of course, there's an alternative. Uh, and it's uh, to do what uh, uh, the 19th century reformers were trying to do and to take uh, the commanding heights, the finance, insurance sector, monopolies into uh, uh, the public uh, hands. The United States has just reduced Europe to uh, a colonial status uh, by destroying German industry. Uh, uh, by uh, the sanctions against Russian oil and gas, uh, there's no way that it can somehow uh, make uh, catch up or compete with uh, China's economy, uh, which is, which has uh, become socialized. So all it can do is uh, make military threats. Uh, it, uh, the United States and Europe have said to Eurasia, if you uh, uh, don't uh, pursue a Thatcherite neoliberal policy, you know, we'll attack you, we can bomb you. Uh, uh, don't you want to join us and avoid being treated like uh, Libya and Syria and uh, Venezuela and the others? That, but on the other hand, you have China, Russia, Iran, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization saying, if you join up, it's us, we want mutual gain. Uh, we want to prevent uh, the privatization of uh, finance. We want to keep uh, money as a public utility. Uh, we want mutual gain in trade, and you'll get rich. Are you going to respond out of fear of uh, the American uh, terrorism uh, now that its uh, economic theory is bankrupt, or are you going to try to uh, enrich yourself and share uh, in the economic growth? That's uh, the way in which the world is uh, splitting today, and that split goes all the way back to the beginning of Western civilization in the seventh century. Thank you for this presentation. Um, now the floor is open for questions. Uh, Oktay, because I don't have my uh, laptop with me, uh, I don't see the hands that I raised. Uh, could you please take it over? Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. So I would definitely find your book. Congratulations on that. That just came out today. So I will definitely make it. And uh, well, I have a question, but it's kind of also interpretation that I would like to elaborate with you. You argue that the failure of recent banking crisis in the United States, including Credit Suisse, and uh, the, the particularly the Silicon Valley Bank, it was the result of this post-2008 so-called unconventional monetary policy, or let's say the quantitative easing, in order to reinflate the real estate price, stock, and the bond prices, right? This was the argument that you based when you connect with the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank. Now, my question is to you, does this confirm that the sources of this the, the turmoil, the, the, this, the, the, the financial state, the, the stress that we currently witness, which is a global banking crisis at the, at the, in, in, in this month, is the result of this cheap money created by speculative by, uh, bubbles inflating the tech and the crypto industries? Uh, wait, your, your question is, is a problem that's inflated the asset bubble? Yeah, yes. basic, yeah. That was the, that, the objective was to inflate the asset bubble. The objective was to prevent the uh, banks and the uh, creditors, uh, the, uh, the basically the one to 10% of the population that owns most stocks and bonds uh, from losing money. It was to, it to prevent, uh, the fact is that uh, they could not maintain their money uh, in, uh, uh, when the economy was being bankrupted, you had uh, default, you, you had junk mortgages. Uh, the the 2008 crisis was really uh, one of uh, uh, mass bank fraud, uh, and that's why they called it junk mortgages because uh, they were junk. That's why they sa uh, said that it's to ninja borrowers, no income, 
no uh, uh, no assets, no jobs. Uh, the uh, the uh, property with missing miss uh, in uh, assets uh, uh, much higher value than it was worth. Uh, there uh, at that point. It was the fraudulent banks that could have gone gone under, but the fraudulent banks were the biggest banks. Uh, Sheila Bear said the most fraudulent and, inco and corruptible was uh, uh, First National Citibank, uh, followed by Bank of America. Uh, this, I think, they've absorbed uh, uh, one of uh, some of the worst uh, uh, homeowners uh, banks and uh, Wells Fargo. So uh, the, the corruption was at the very top, but uh, the recent bank failure wasn't because of corruption. Uh, there's no question that uh, uh, the government is able to pay the debts. Uh, the uh, the uh, mortgages uh, can be paid. They weren't uh, in arrears by the banks. The the problem was interest. That uh, once you had lowered the interest rates to inflate the value, if you reverse this by raising the interest rates, then uh, all of a sudden uh, you're going to reduce uh, all the assets. But the instead of using this uh, reflation of the banks to uh, rationalize banking, to uh, create banking in the way that uh, uh, the late 19th century German banks were developing. Instead of industrializing banking and having it serve the economy, uh, the banks did what bankers do. Uh, they in indulged in speculation and uh, uh, just asset price inflation and uh, reducing that essentially uh, left uh, the banking sector, uh, se uh, banking sector uh, uh, in negative equity, and it can't get out of this uh, without. Uh, uh, there's no all, there's no way in which uh, today's debts can be paid, and of course that's been my uh, my thesis uh, for all the years that uh, I've known uh, you guys. Debts that can't be paid won't be paid, but the government doesn't uh, recognize this. The government and the bank regulators and the banks say yes, the debts can be paid as long as the government uh, uh, gives. Uh, enough money to uh, to keep them uh, whole to enable it. So uh, the what the government is doing is creating credit to bail out the creditors, not writing down credit to save the indebted economy as a whole. It's adding to the debt overhead. Uh, it, the only way that the government can uh, 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 rescue the banks is to create yet another nine trillion dollars uh, uh, to give to the banks to uh, match the nine trillion that uh, uh, they already uh, had uh, gambled away in, since uh, 2009. Uh, they, uh, and that would be more asset price inflation. The stock market's up today. Stock market was yep, up yesterday because uh, investors think, yep, that's what the government's going to do. We're in control. Uh, they're going to save us. That's uh, where the economy is going. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you see me? Yes. Hello, Professor. First of all, I, I want to thank you uh, for this invaluable presentation. Uh, it's, it's a huge honor for me uh, to listen uh, to listen you uh, if i don't misunderstand uh, eventually you state that uh, china as a contender against united states uh, follows a different way uh, for example uh, in terms of uh, privatization of uh, financial sectors for now on the other hand, uh, as we can see from uh, China's steps uh, against the United States, uh, it's a fact that, at least I think, uh, China's policies against the United States uh, are so similar, actually. For example, uh, in uh, 2018, uh, China declared uh, in uh, Shanghai uh, stock exchange market uh, using of petro yuan which backed back by uh, gold nevertheless uh, we know that uh, this step of china is actually a step against uh, petrodollar domination in the world markets uh, if china 
uh, follows uh, such a path, uh, we will we can say that uh, China may become may become uh, the new, the new United States actually. From this point, uh, how can we say that uh, China follows a different uh, way against the United States? I don't think there's any way that China's currency is going to be uh, a rival uh, to the dollar. Uh, its idea of de-dollarizing is to diversify uh, its uh, holdings and to uh, urge uh, central banks throughout the world to hold uh, mute, uh currency swaps in each other's currency. There is some talk of developing a, uh, uh, of joint creating an alternative to the International Monetary Fund by creating a new kind of a central bank uh, that will issue something like uh, this uh, IMF special drawing rights, or more accurately, uh, Keynes's uh, Bancor uh, that he'd uh, suggested in uh, 1944. Uh, but uh, ch uh, ch China, uh, no country is uh, ever again going to be in a similar position to the United States of uh, using its uh, own currency as uh, the basis of uh, world foreign, ex uh, foreign exchange holdings. Uh, the difference is that the United States was flooding the whole world with dollars thrown off uh, ever since the Korean War in 1951 uh, by foreign military spending. Uh, China doesn't have foreign military spending like the United States. Uh, the whole structure of the economy is so different uh, that uh, there, uh, uh, there's no similarity. Uh, for the time being, China, Russia, and other countries are trying to, uh, they're uh, running down their dollar reserves uh, and building up either gold reserves and mutual currency. That's what uh, China's been doing with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, and uh, Russia and other countries. And so what we're going to see is a multipolarity of international finance instead of the unipolarity that was based uh, on the uh, American dollar. There'll be swap arrangements and uh, a new kind of a central bank uh, that will uh, have different operating principles, to put it mildly, from the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, but at that point, uh, we know that China uh, tries to found new institutions uh, as an alternative uh, to uh, Bretton Woods institutions such as World Bank and IMF, for example, Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank or uh, BRICS Bank, New Development Bank, etc. Uh, and also we know that uh, China uh, aims to uh, become its own currency to internationalize. Uh, yes. from, the, from this point, can we say that uh, one way or another, uh, China will uh, follow the path of United States in terms of hegemonic cycle uh, in the world. Uh, I want to say this question uh, actually from your uh, uh, super imperialism book. Well, uh, you, you could say uh, the same for Guatemala. Is Guatemala or Ecuador going to take over the world and replace the United States uh, by trying to uh, make its own currency held by foreign central banks? Uh, I don't think Guatemala is going to take over the United States, and uh, uh, I think all kind of, uh, China's model is not so unique to China. The whole idea of uh, the alternative to the dollar is that it will be multipolar uh, for many countries. Uh, there won't be a single currency. Of course, uh, uh, China, other central banks are going to hold uh, the Chinese currency. Uh, uh, but they're also going to continue to hold the dollar. Uh, they may even hold euros. Uh, they'll hold each other's currencies. Uh, it's going to be a, a multilateralism, uh, not, uh, not a single uh, concentration. Other countries, I don't think, are going to go into any single country uh, m m having the unique ability to simply print its debt, uh, and, uh, as IOUs, and spend into the world. The United States internationally is in negative equity. It's just as broke uh, as, as the banks are. That's uh, Other countries are trying to uh, withdraw from this situation. Uh, uh, there's, uh, I don't see any chance of China going down this road. Okay, thank you, Professor. I see Michael Keeney. Thank you, Vin.
very much. Yeah. Probably yeah. That was very, very interesting as I would have. Michael. All your books are interesting. And I wanted to, to say two things. First, an observation. This, this was interesting. It, it, it's so hard to understand one, you. The, the, the volume, it's, I don't know, I, I can't make out your words. Can you, Sabri, can you understand him? No, um, apparently there is some problem with the mic Michael is using. That I'm using? Oh, that Michael Kukin is using. No, yeah. not you do, the other Michael. Yeah. Could it be possible that Michael Keeney, um, uh, yeah, he's doing it. Do you see the uh, chat, Michael? Uh -oh. uh, one of you will have to uh, read it to me. Uh, yeah, uh, I should read it because I don't have the means to do that. Uh-huh. Wait, my take on what? <laughs> uh, it's to uh, accelerate inflation as rapidly as possible. It, uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. It, it, uh, uh, it Essentially, it's uh, to give free money to his campaign contributors. To make a long story short, that's uh, uh, anything Biden does is to give money to his campaign contributors, mainly on Wall Street. It has nothing to do with inflation uh, reduction. Uh, all, what he really wants to do is cut wages. Uh, when you say inflation reduction is, uh, 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 we may have a translation problem. It's the American term for uh, cutting wages uh, and uh, um, uh, um, unemploying labor. When economists say uh, fighting inflation, uh, it's just anti-labor policy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you... Uh... Okay, Michael has another <laughs> question. Okay, can you read it? Can, can, uh, could you read it to me? I... Sabri, could you hear what he said? Could, could you? IRA. Uh, uh, do, do you mean is is a uh, invest investment uh, investment IRAs or the Irish Revolutionary Army? No, no, no. no. Uh, I think they mean inflation reduction. What? Oh, okay. Ah, right. It's to uh, re yes. Uh, it, it's to uh, promote American industry. It's a protectionist act, largely against Germany. Uh, now that America has cut off uh, Germany's uh, oil and gas uh, supply, uh, it's uh, left uh, German uh, industries with a choice. Well, uh, the only way, there's no way that you can make profits by uh, paying six times as uh, much for uh, oil and gas as uh, you were before, and as Americans have to pay, and other countries have to pay. So why don't you move your uh, uh, industry to the United States, uh, maybe to the non-unionized uh, southern states? Uh, then you can get uh, inexpensive American oil and gas, uh, and you won't have to buy that expensive uh, uh, for, uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, German-priced uh, oil and gas. So. Uh, Essentially, it's uh, invited German industry to, now that it's uh, colonized uh, Germany and uh, Europe uh, and essentially destroyed its industry, it suggests it moves to the U.S. So German industry has a choice. Well, it, they can fire their domestic uh, labor force. They can tell Germans, well, uh, you can all move to Alabama where we're going to build a new uh, uh, steel factory there. Uh, uh, or they, they may be thinking themselves, well, what if we move to Russia? to get uh, lower uh, uh, oil and gas prices? What if we move to Iran? What if we move to China? 
uh, the question is, uh, where are they going to move? Uh, I think the the only choice for them, uh, given their political leadership that's uh, uh, very loyal to the United States, uh, despite the fact that the populations are marching in the streets uh, to oppose uh, uh, the Ukraine war, which is really the Russia-China war, uh, the, uh, the politicians are sort of trying to uh, arm twist uh, German industry to leave the country and uh, uh, let Germany go back to uh, farming. Let, let them go back to uh, the 18th century uh, rural ideal. I mean, what else can, uh, but they can't really go back to farming because the German fertilizer companies have gone out of business because they used uh, Russian gas uh, as an input uh, to make fertilizer. So uh, uh, the, it looks like, uh, you're right, the Inflation Reduction Act is a protectionist uh, and it, it leaves uh, Germany looking sort of like Latvia. Uh, in the Baltic states. Uh, it looks like depopulation is uh, in their future. Emigration. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm thrilled uh, to hear that the book came out because I really love the first one and I was really looking forward to the second one. So uh, I'm I'm really, really happy to, to hear this and the presentation was great. So my question has to do with uh, this one of the last points that you touched upon uh, towards the end of the talk with respect to this alternative block forming in the East with um, uh, China, Russia, and you know uh, uh, the other countries that you mentioned. Uh, I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about what kind of a debt governance regime are we looking at? Uh, what kind of a what building? regime? Debt governance. Are they going to ah. cancel? Are they going to forgive yeah. all the debts? That's basically going to, uh, you know, when we talk about sovereign debt or also looking inside China at the domestic front. Um, I know from uh, Johannes Petri's work that there's this financialization without financial liberalization in China, but there's also the problem of debt uh, you know, uh, inside the country as well. So what are we really looking at? What is this alternative that governance going to look like? Thank you. Well, the, uh, the, the countries have a choice right now. When the United States raised its interest rates, this made uh, the dollar appreciate against the, uh, uh, the uh, African and South uh, American and global South currencies. So uh, these countries have a choice. Either they pay uh, pay their uh, foreign debts, uh, but if if they pay their foreign debts, how are they going to afford to import the high priced oil and gas, uh, the high priced food as a result of uh, the uh, American sanctions against Russia? Uh, uh, are they going to impose austerity on their country, or are they going to uh, say uh, just uh, repudiate their foreign debts? Uh, I think that. Uh, th th if they're independent, they must repudiate the foreign debts. And I think China should uh, take the lead in saying uh, you uh, you can free your economies from uh, being strangled by, uh, the, uh, by the odious debts that the IMF and the World Bank have extended to you. The IMF has shown, it's, uh, the IMF is an agency of uh, the U.S. Uh, military, of the Defense Department. Uh, you saw that this week when the IMF said, uh, even though our uh, articles of agreement say we cannot make loans to a country at war, we're making loans to Ukraine because it's in the American interest and we're an agency of the United States military. Uh, just as uh, two months ago, it said, even though our articles of agreement say we cannot make loans to countries that we know can't pay. We said in 1991, no more Argentinas. But despite that, we're making loans to Ukraine because we work for the U.S. military. Just as the heads of the World Bank have often been the U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, the uh, IMF heads have always been a European uh, loyal to the U.S. Secretary of Defense and uh, the military. So uh, the, the debts to the IMF and that the IMF have organized for, uh, for dollar holders are odious debts. They were debts intended uh, either intended to bankrupt uh, the uh, the countries 
that uh, go into debt to force them to pay their debts by selling off and privatizing uh, their public domain, their natural resources, their public utilities, their oil and gas systems, uh, their uh, electric utilities to privatize them all. Uh, this is, is war. And uh, the, su the southern countries should realize that uh, these debts are an act of war. Uh, now that war has really been declared, by the uh, uh, America against all other countries, uh, we are uh, repudiating the dollar debts, uh, and they could never do this before because there was no there was no alternative, as Margaret Thatcher would say. Uh, there uh, there wasn't a critical mass, but now China, Russia, the Ukraine, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, and their allies have created a critical mass, so they don't need the United States economy anymore. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank were put in uh, in place when the United States was was still the industrial center of the world in um, World War II. But that's not the case. America's deindustrialized. If it's deindustrialized, and uh, what on earth does it have to offer the world except uh, offering not to bomb it, not to uh, treat it, not to treat the world like it's treated Ar 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 Iran and Iraq and Syria and Libya and Venezuela. Uh, the, all it has is the threat. And uh, that, uh, that is what is uh, obviously under discussion now throughout uh, the entire non-US uh, and European uh, world. How do we create an alternative and free ourselves uh, from uh, uh, to develop without having to pay reparations? Otherwise, you're going to have uh, the whole global South looking like uh, Haiti. Uh, looked at in the early 19th century when it had to pay France to buy its freedom, uh, to free its slaves uh, from the French. Uh, and unless the uh, uh, global south uh, wants to fall, uh, end up like Haiti ended up, uh, is just a uh, satellite of the creditors, uh, it's going to have to repudiate the debts. Thank you. Have I just gone? Did I shock you all with this? I don't know. No. <laughs> I mean, do, do you agree? What, what do you think? Well, uh, I am so familiar with everything you said, so that uh, I'm not shocked at all. Um, I have a question, Michael. Uh, no. If I'm not wrong, um, yesterday or the day before, I uh, saw uh, an article um, where Russia announced that they are going to trade on with Asia. Well, they're uh, what? They are going to trade yeah. with uh, Asian countries, uh, whatever they trade, um, including oil. Yeah. Yeah. In yuans. Yeah. Um, do you think that would create a threat to the dollar hegemony? I think they must have uh, had some discussion uh, with China about this, uh, uh, that uh, by doing this, they'll get mutual uh, support. They certainly can't do their trade in dollars because the Americans have grabbed uh, $300 billion worth of uh, uh, Russian holdings uh, in the West and says it's going to give them to Ukrainians, which means give them to American senators. You, by giving $300 billion to the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians then turn around and put it back into the campaign, uh, the campaign uh, 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 bank accounts of uh, the leading Democratic Party uh, officials and uh, Republicans that agree on their side. It's a circular flow, uh, so they give it to themselves. Uh, but uh, Russia's afraid to can't hold dollars, uh, and uh, the only currency that is uh, a large enough alternative uh, really is uh, uh, China's currency right now. But I think that must have been what uh, President Putin and President Xi were talking about. How do we create a, a group of uh, currencies into really a multi-currency uh, uh, bank for all of this? This. This has to, because I'm sure that China is very worried uh, about how the United States will grab all of its dollar holdings. Well, what can China do? What can it grab that is a U.S. Uh, holding? Uh, you really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the U.S. is threatened to, uh, uh, now is trying to retaliate against uh, 
all world airlines that have the right to fly across Russia, uh, since uh, Russia has stopped U.S. airlines from flying across its space in response to America banning Russian airlines from flying across its space. So very quickly, uh, the, uh, the U.S. is sort of forcing other countries to use an alternative, and uh, the intermediate step, the, uh, the transition, seems to be to use uh, a combination of Chinese currency and gold maybe Indian currency also, uh, now Iranian currency. Uh, I'm sure they're going to uh, diversify into as uh, multi uh, multilateral uh, a group as they can uh, put together. And you're going to see, I'm sure, all the discussions this summer go along with this, and it'll probably be hand-in-hand uh, -hand with uh, large-scale defaults on uh, global south payment of uh, dollar debts. Sounds great. Uh, in this case, uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, discussion. And uh, I'm sure we are going to meet again. Indeed, uh, I'll be in New York uh, mm -hmm. in, in a month or so. Hopefully, it'll be we'll warm weather then. We'll uh, get together. Well, I hope so. Uh, thanks, and uh, we'll see you again. Bye.